Want an authoritative answer on the question, can we afford a new state? You've come to the right place. Welcome to Northern Vibe. Thanks very much for tuning in. If we've never met, I'm Matt Maloney, host and founder of Northern Vibe. Northern Vibe is where discussions are held with interesting, informed people to gain their perspective on a new state and on any other issues that attract our curiosity. We're about sharing stories. Now, please like and share this page. Ask questions, make comments. We're getting some great suggestions from listeners on the comments page, so please keep them coming. This includes suggestions for guests. I've actually had a number of people reach out to me for guests. And if you're interested in coming on Northern Vibe, contact me through the Facebook page. Every week, we do a mention in dispatches, and this week's mention in dispatches goes out to Australian Red Cross. They do some great work at the Cairns Wellbeing Centre, Pat Gosper Place. I've got lots of my mates from Cape York who come down and stay with them. They've got a website and they're always seeking volunteers. So hop on and have a look. Now for this episode, I'm pretty excited. I've, ex I've ex secured the time of highly experienced regional business economist, Bill Cummings. Bill was born and educated in Cairns and took an economics degree from the University of Queensland in 1961 with majors in economics, accounting, maths, statistics, statistical mathematics. I don't know when he slept. This was followed by seven years experience in economic research in Canberra as a research officer with the Department of Trade and as a research officer at the Australian Chamber of Commerce. Bill returned to the North in 68, spent five years as manager of the Ingham District Research and Promotion Bureau, followed by eight years as manager of the Far North Queensland Development Bureau and its sub board for tourism and travel, which is now tropical tourism, tropical North Queensland. Also in his spare time, he set up his own economic and marketing research business in 1981. So apart from carrying out a wide ranging economic and uh, market research, covering almost all aspects of the economy, especially in, in Australia's tropical Northeast, he served on a, a number of boards and committees over the years, including deputy chairman for the North Australia Development Council and on the council of the James Cook University in Queensland. A rather impressive resume if I do make the observation. Bill, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, welcome, uh, Matt. Well, what we'll do is um, I'll, get, I'll get you to tell a little bit of something of yourself and your family and your professional background, just for our viewers who may not know who you are. Uh, Matt, uh, well, my family uh, roots go right back to the beginnings of the uh, Cairns Far North Queensland region. Uh, on uh, both sides of the family. My wife's uh, family goes back to the origins of uh, Townsville. Um, so um, I've seen, uh, and my, between my, myself and my grandparents, we've virtually seen the whole of the history of, uh, of uh, far north Queensland uh, come through over the years. So uh, I've been very much steeped in uh, the whole process of development of the uh, of the north, and of course, um, uh, after I finished school, I went down to university in Brisbane, uh, and then went through to Canberra, and that was very valuable uh, uh, to give me national insights and uh, be involved with policy making uh, with the Department of Trade in the tariff policy section, which was a big issue at that time, and then uh, subsequently with the Australian Chamber of Commerce with that really got me over to do tariff board cases, uh, uh, but uh, a wide range of uh, comment and uh, uh, policy issues uh, at a, a national level, uh, particularly affecting business. And uh, of course that led to relationships or uh, uh, contacts with uh, the uh, commercial embassies in Canberra and the uh, uh, the press gallery and the uh, politicians and the public service and so forth. Uh, so uh, with that background, uh, in 1968, I came back north and as you've said, uh, managed the development and tourism organisations and, uh, and had a, uh, uh, a deep experience there with the development uh, of the, particularly of the Cairns Farm North Queensland region, uh, but also uh, being exposed to you know what was happening across the uh, rest of the north, um, and then in my own business, uh, we've dabbled or done work in just about every industry uh, group across the north and almost every region, up into Papua New Guinea, even to the Pacific, uh, done some consulting work up there. Um, so um, 
uh, I've seen a fair bit of the uh, development of the North, uh, particularly over the last 30, 40 years. Wow. That is really, really interesting. And I, I'd like to make a quick observation when I'm talking to uh, people, everyone kind of says, well, you know, uh, why are people so kind of obsessed with uh, money and economics and it's a detriment uh, of people. And the argument I always use is, is this, well, first, yes, economics is the study, uh, econo economics is fundamentally the study of human behavior, really, because that's what economy, that, that's what economics is about. We measure it through money and we measure it through wealth. We measure it through these things, but economies are made up of humans. That's right. It's fundamentally what it's about. So this strange idea that people have, and they talk about it all the time going, well, people like you, Matt, that are kind of really concerned about wealth creation and economies, it's to the detriment of human beings. The direct opposite is true. Um, for me, economics is actually tied up uh, with morality. The more we can create wealth for people, the better we can make people's lives, the more we can empower them to do things for themselves, the better we're making things for them. And of course, for the communities at, at large. So, you know, chaps like you who are working in the background, uh, keeping, the, uh, keeping the steam engine of our economy going really are contributing quite a lot. And, um, and also your perspective is, is sincerely valued. So, you know, again, thank you very much for, for coming on. Yes, uh, Matt, actually one of the early lectures in uh, economics uh, tagged it as the, the study of how uh, unlimited uh, wants uh, are met by limited means. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, there's, that, uh, there's that balance that uh, uh, people's desires and wants are always uh, more than uh, what can actually be delivered. And economics is the business of how we go about uh, that uh, reaching that balance uh, between the uh, between the two um, so um, and it, although a lot of it is about money uh, it is really fundamentally about people and how they react and the choices they make um, in a, on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, uh, the uh, that's uh, that's the fundamental of it but uh, one of the important things particularly in regional economics is uh, that uh, you're looking at uh, a, a lot of geography, a lot of history, uh, a, a lot of other uh, disciplines. And of course, at the side, uh, you get into psychology because of that, uh, uh, that business of people, how they make their minds up and uh, how they react. And uh, actually, I had a, an engineer friend um, who couldn't understand why we couldn't plan the economy. Uh, you know, engineers are typically, uh, uh, you know, great planners of, of, uh, of how to go about things. But I explained it to him in this terms. Uh, I said, as an engineer, uh, if you nail something to a wall, uh, it normally stays there in economics uh, because people's attitudes and circumstances change over time. Uh, at, that will move around on the wall and even occasionally the wall itself will move. So it's very, very difficult to plan. Uh, one of the, uh, and, and of course, one of the fundamentals uh, behind uh, economics that came out of Adam Smith, the uh, great Scottish uh, originator of uh, political economy uh, was the importance of letting people decide uh, what they want uh to uh, to happen oh, so get into politics yeah and absolutely. obviously it was called political economy to start with and absolutely. Uh, obviously once you're in economics uh there's a whole lot of uh, a, a very a whole lot of political decisions dependent upon uh economic judgments absolutely and look uh if we do have that's raised a whole raft of questions about a, you know a magnificent discussion we could have around the uh, morality of economics and uh, and the psychology of uh, psychology of that, and God willing, at the end of it, at at the end of the interview, if we have a little bit more time, we'll kind of run into that. But we are here for the new state. So the first question I'm going to ask you, Bill, is like historically, why do you believe there um, there hasn't been a new state in the north so far? Uh, well, to understand the situation, you've, you've well, there's been two factors. 
uh, basically, uh, one's been economic and the other uh, has been political. Um, however, to understand the situation, you've got to appreciate uh, that the North uh, is tropical. Uh, it represented a, a great challenge uh, to a new nation that with most of its people and its technology derived from Northwestern Europe. And uh, so there were great challenges there in the, uh, in the early days. Now it was, uh, of course, the British were uh, very familiar with tropical areas previously. Uh, and uh, it's significant that they started off at, uh, uh, at Port, or Botany Bay, Port Jackson uh, area, rather than Cooktown where Cook spent most of his time. And uh, the, uh, it, was, it was late being settled. Uh, and uh, the, it, it went great guns for a while. And uh, we had uh, the pastoralists move into the area. We had uh, the mining start very much straight away. Uh, the, uh, and then you had the plantations and the agriculture startup, forestry, uh, fisheries uh, start up with the, uh, with the pearling. And uh, uh, it, it was going very well in the, uh, the late 1800s. Uh, but a couple of things happened that, uh, that uh, deeply affected it uh, because there was always uh, a question of um, right up until the 30s, there was learned articles uh, about it being an experiment of white settlers in the tropics that the, where the Europeans could live and work hard in the, uh, in the tropics and it being regarded as something of an experiment. And uh, so uh, it was against that background of uncertainty. Now, those two things that happened in the late 1990s, the pastoral industry got knocked back very, very badly um, of course, sheep, the great developers, Merino sheep, uh, did not prosper in the north. They're not, they're a Mediterranean uh, uh, animal. And um, the, uh, of course, it was magnificent for Southern Australia because uh, Merino sheep uh, turned the grass of the, uh, the pastoral resources of the south into a commodity uh, that could stand the long, it was a relatively high value commodity that could stand the, the, the long transport time back to, uh, back to Europe. Now that didn't, uh, the North did not have that and wheat uh, did not uh, prosper uh, in the North, which is, which is tropical uh, now, uh, but they moved into cattle. Uh, and in the 1990s, uh, red water fever that was tick-borne came in from Asia and absolutely devastated the, uh, the pastoral industry. In fact, it wasn't until the 1950s that some areas got back to the carrying rate uh, that there was in the, uh, in the 1990s. And then Federation came along and there was a major uh, change uh, occur to the, uh, uh, to the uh, growing sugar industry, the plantation industries, et cetera. And with the White Australia policy, the, uh, uh, the switch from a plantation system with indentured labour uh, to a small farmer uh, system uh, under the protection and, uh, of a, an embargo on sugar imports. Um, uh, but the whole industry had to adjust to that. At that time, we did have a banana industry actually before Federation uh, shipping to the south. And we also had tea and coffee starting. Uh, however, protection wasn't uh, uh, extended to those industries and uh, uh, they died. And uh, so, uh, but in the meantime, of course, the big industry uh, was, uh, was mining and it, it continued basically in the first uh, 10 years of the uh, new century, uh, the economy here was absolutely dominated by mining. Now, uh, what happened, of course, is that um, uh, the sugar industry was expanding slowly. Uh, oh, there was also a, a marine frontier uh, with, the, uh, with the pearling industry uh, at that stage, uh, in the, particularly in the Torres Strait. Uh, but uh, what happened was that, uh, of course, the First World War came along. Oh, as far as the new state goes, there was a very strong movement uh, uh, pre-Federation and Queensland insisted that there was a, uh, a provision there that would enable new states in, uh, in Queensland. However, uh, with those checks coming through and with the First World War 
And then during the, after the First World War, in fact, the mining collapsed also. Now sugar was coming through with additional sugar mills and that sort of thing. And, uh, and then there was the depression and then there was the Second World War. Now, at the end of the Second World War, basically when you looked at the economy uh, of the area, uh, it was dominated by sugar. Uh, basically, far North Queensland, it was basically a sugar economy with a bit of local agriculture uh, on the tablelands and the uh, start of a, a tobacco industry, but also a protected industry. Um, however, uh, you know, at that stage, the mining industry had gone and also the, the pearling industry had, uh, had gone. And uh, in uh, the 1947 census, Cairns was 16,000, Townsville was 30 odd thousand, Rocky uh, was uh, 30 odd thousand and Mackay was about uh, 16 or 14,000, I think. And so it was quite small, uh, the, the economy. and. Uh, uh, and of course, against that background, that economic background, it was very difficult to uh, see the establishment of, uh, of a new state. Uh, now, uh, but things changed in the 1960s. And in fact, uh, the, uh, in Townsville, of course, uh, you had the army base and the university start up. But more, more broadly, there are a number of uh, factors that uh, have led to very major growth. Over the, um, over the past 40, 50 years. And um, the, uh, first of all, the mining came back. The early mining had been mainly uh, high value minerals, uh, gold and copper and silver and, and tin and things like that. Whereas the, it was the great sedimentary deposits in the North that had come through. And of course, coal in, uh, in uh, central Queensland uh, but uh, in this region, uh, up in the north, the uh, bauxite uh, and silica sand uh, came through. Now, Mount Isa was a high value mineral, but it didn't come in until the 1920s. And of course, it also boomed uh, uh, in that, uh, that post-war period. So we had uh, the mining come through. Fisheries came back uh, with, the, uh, with the prawning uh, in, the, uh, in the Gulf of uh, Carpentaria particularly and uh, on the uh, on the east coast and in agriculture there were three major uh, three major turnarounds uh, the first was in the pastoral industry the introduction of brahmin cattle uh, that were much more suited to the uh, environment and uh, not uh, as subject to things like uh, ticks and so forth and uh, cattle numbers across the north have grown very very strongly and uh, actually on a, on a per acre basis or hectare basis, uh, there are now more cattle in the north than there are in Southern Australia. And uh, the other big development, of course, was the mechanization of sugar uh, the, and the bog sugar terminals and uh, that sort of thing, which brought the cost down. I was in Canberra at the time when the sugar industry was complaining about Australia's uh, 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 the Australian sugar industry was complaining about the, the cheap labour sugar of the rest of the world and uh, facing a problem for our, uh, uh, our industry. Uh, a couple of decades later, overseas sugar countries were complaining of Australia's cheap mechanised sugar uh, <laughs> because the, uh, the uh, mechanisation of it uh, absolutely revolutionised things. And by the 1980s, in fact, we went on to a free world market. It, the sugar industry was one of those protected industries that uh, that did grow up uh, over the over the years to become fully uh, fully internationally uh, viable. Uh, but the third major thing that has happened is that in the 1960s there was a book written by a fellow uh, uh, Bruce Davidson uh, called the Northern Myth that damned any uh, agricultural development, cropping development in the uh, uh, in the north. Um, however, uh, that's changed. And the big factor in it, of course, we could grow a whole lot of things uh, more efficiently and cheaply in the north. Uh, but the big factor was transport costs. Uh, and as the Bruce Highway got sealed and semi trailers came along, uh, we suddenly turned around and we were able to grow bananas we, uh, uh, and, and other horticultural produce. Now, now uh, the Cairns region is now the third largest fruit producing region uh, in Australia. 
Now, th that is a major, major change uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the status of the, uh, of the North. So against, oh, and then the other thing that came along, of course, we've had the brilliant tourism resources. People have been coming to see them right from year dot uh, with the coastal shipping and then the, uh, the railway and then the family car and finally uh, uh, aviation. And of course, tourism has come through uh, magnificently. And in the Cairns region, of course, it's come through to exceed, you know, the mining and the agriculture and the fisheries uh, uh, individually, not, not necessarily combined. Um, so we've had this very major uh, development and sitting behind it uh, have been a number of major factors. And one of those, of course, has been the growth of uh, world markets, is reaching out for uh, uh, new produce and so forth. And uh, of course, there's been a, a lot of that world growth in more recent decades has been in Northeast Asia, that's relatively close to us. And we've seen those, uh, those impacts uh, come through. Uh, but the second major factor was transport. And of course, I just outlined how the development of transport enabled all these horticultural uh, uh, industries uh, to come through, but also bulk carriers enabled those uh, uh, mineral resources, they bought mineral resources to uh, be developed and jumbo jets that enabled the tourism uh, to be developed. Now also in there is communications and uh, I should point out that that transport uh, development has got a negative side uh, to it because it also means that it's cheaper to get uh, commodities into, uh, into the north and we've seen some of the loss of uh, manufacturing and so forth like uh, breweries and, uh, and brickworks. Um, and now the third factor uh, has been the development of technology suited to the North. And we saw this, uh, we've seen this across a broad field. And it's not just been in the agricultural industries and export industries, it's also been in everyday living. The, the introduction of uh, air conditioning has absolutely changed uh, uh, circumstances in the region and the, uh, the livability. Uh, of the region. When I first came back north out of Canberra, I was um, really uh, surprised. I picked up pieces of paper and they were linked uh, compared to the um, uh, crinkly stuff that <laughs> you had in Canberra. Uh, however, in air conditioning, it's a, it's, it's a very different uh, thing, but also in everyday living, you know, these jet sprays to get rid of the mold and all that sort of thing. And in, in health, knocking over uh, things like dengue uh, fever and uh, malaria. And so there's been a whole lot of technology uh, that's been uh, favorable uh, to, uh, to tropical areas. And finally, of course, you, you success breeds success as the population builds up and so forth. You can afford to have um, a whole lot of new extra facilities. Uh, for instance, in Cairns, it's enabled us to uh, go through to have a uh, university campus with uh, museums, uh, art galleries, uh, better sporting facilities, uh, and a whole lot of things like that. Uh, so uh, that really make it more, uh, more livable and attractive to, uh, to people. So we've had a big growth of uh, industry and population in the region. Cairns has gone through from uh, 16,000 to about 160,000 a day. Uh, and uh, uh, in the process, past seven other regional cities in, uh, in Australia. And although it's led to growth, you know, there's been strong growth in Townsville and Mackay and, and uh, not so much in Rocky, a lot of the growth there has been in Gladstone. So uh, uh, as far as the new state goes, it's a very different picture now to what it was, uh, you know, back when I first started my, uh, my working career. And the, um, uh, however, the, uh, one of the factors that has, uh, during that period, has um, uh, uh, come through has been the political structure. Um, actually, there was a new state movement in towns with Professor Roderick at, at JCU uh, back in uh, the early 70s, uh, was, uh, was promoting it strongly, and uh, a chap Frank Rossiter from uh, the Burdekin. Uh, however, uh, the, in uh, the 1950s, there was a change from, there'd been a Labor government for 28 years and the coalition came in, the country party uh, liberal coalition. But importantly, uh, the 
uh, the country party was the, uh, which is now called the National Party, of course, uh, was the dominant partner uh, in it. And it was only the dominant partner uh, because in Queensland, it, it, there would have been a similar mix uh, to New South Wales and Victoria, but the, the big tropical underdeveloped annex of Queensland uh, 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 tended to have views similar to regional uh, southern Queensland. And uh, it, the, the North's position in that led to the country party uh, being the, the dominant partner in the uh, coalition. Uh, so for uh, quite some time during that period from the 50s uh, through to when there was a change of government in the 90s, uh, you, you had a government that was very, very conscious of the, uh, of the North and uh, country needs and very pro-development of things like uh, mining and agriculture uh, and, uh, and so forth. Now, of course, uh, there's been a change since then uh, that progressively, of course, the southeast Queensland, basically because regional Queensland has grown much faster than regional New South Wales, regional Victoria, it's grown faster than uh, uh, the, uh, Tasmania and, uh, wow. and uh, South Australia. Uh, because of that, the southeast of Brisbane and the southeast corner have grown faster than Sydney and Melbourne and uh, have, have, uh, have come up. And uh, so the balance within Queensland uh, has, has changed. That area has grown faster than the north and, of course, has uh, got an increasing uh, proportion of the, uh, the politicians, the, uh, uh, the state representatives in that, uh, that area. Uh, so there's, you know, there is a real question there uh, of, you know, the balance uh, within Queensland and policies, uh, of, of, you know, statewide, uh, statewide policy, et cetera. Wow. That, um, you covered off on so many issues there and is, that raised so many questions. And I'm going to make a couple of observations before I, uh, before I jump into the, ne the next question. That was really, that was a quite succinct overview of, um, uh, or pretty much our our foundation, really. You're, you're obviously quite correct when you have this personal knowledge of what's going on. But for, one of the things that struck me is first the interdependence of uh, of economic of all these different economic industries. You know, there's there's this idea that um, you can kind of isolate things, and and quite you know quite clearly that's that's just not the case. Secondly, um, you know, or well, going back to that really quickly, you know, you get an expansion in one area, and and you kind of get a bit of a contraction in other areas. And that includes with both, um, from what I was listening to there, that includes both in the private sector and, of course, the government. So, you know, if you get the government expanding in one area, you get a little bit of a, you get a corresponding contraction. So that, that, was, a, that was a really, really deep and pretty, if I can say, pretty cool way of explaining things. The double-edged sword of transport. I've also lived uh, disproportionately in, in, in regional Queensland. And, and like, I used to live in uh, Winton. And Winton, just before I got there, had a, soft drink factory and had a brick, it had a brick works. It had all these sorts of, um, had all these sorts of things and it, and it had, uh, it had a, a number of butcheries. So transport is a good thing and allowing all these accessibilities, but there's always a, uh, you know, there's that payoff and there's that flip um, uh, with that. The, the last observation I'll make is there really have been periods of diversity. So we kind of started off as a very broad, diverse economy. Then we, then we kind of like moved into the area of sugar, which pretty much limited our diversity. And now we're moving back to another area of diversity. And of course, none of us really know what's going to happen with, with COVID, but that was, that was really, really um, interesting. Just for our listeners, can I get you to just uh, indicate, because uh, there was a lot of information there and it was put really well. Can we directly answer the question? If we drew a line, say a little bit south of Gladstone, can we support financially a new state? Uh, well, uh, that area down to uh, to Gladstone uh, really includes, you know, four major regions and the, the Cairns-based region and Townsville and Mackay and, uh, and uh, that based on Rockhampton, Gladstone. And um, actually, if you have a look at it in terms of population now, um, uh, many years ago uh, <laughs> in my career, you had to add up those four regions, their population, before you could get to the regions the size of Tasmania. 
uh, now that area is twice the size of Tasmania in population. Actually, Cairns and Townsville regions are put together are uh, more than Tasmania. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the other thing, of course, is that compared with the Northern Territory, uh, that area is about four times, uh, four or five times uh, the, uh, the population. So there's about a million people uh, compared to South Australia. That's uh, one point. I think South Australia is at 1.7 million with a lot of it in, uh, in Adelaide. And um, so we would come in in population uh, up, uh, uh, up towards South Australia and growing faster uh, over a uh, you know, long-term trend. There's, of course, there's accelerations and decelerations. We're going through a, a relatively you know, slower growth period at present. Uh, but uh, when you compare it across the, uh, the, uh, the Commonwealth, uh, in mining and uh, mining royalties and revenue, et cetera, uh, we would come in after second to Western Australia, uh, the um, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, you know head of Southeast Queensland and or, or Southern Queensland and New South Wales and Victoria and Tasmania and etc. Um, in terms of agriculture, um, we would come in up around the same as. Uh, uh, southern Queensland and uh, uh, South Australia would be behind uh, New South Wales and Victoria, and I think behind uh, Western Australia, but well, or well ahead. Actually, the Cairns region alone is uh, uh, in uh, in agriculture, particularly in cropping, is is ahead of Tasmania. Um, now, when you look at tourism and international tourism, uh, in international holiday tourism, as opposed to visiting friends and relatives, etc. Uh, the Cairns region alone is uh, ahead of uh, Western Australia, South Australia, Tasmania, Northern Territory. Uh, so we would come in uh, 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 up towards uh, Southern Queensland and uh, in behind uh, New South Wales. Actually, the Cairns region um, is in holiday, international holiday tourism right up there just behind Melbourne. Uh, so, you know, very strong in a number of those, uh, those basic industries. Fisheries, we're well up there uh, uh, with it. Mining, uh, well, that's what I've said, we're, uh, uh, we're second. Uh, uh, actually, um, so the base is, is pretty strong. And when you look at the uh, uh, gross regional product or gross domestic product or gross state product, depending on the area you're talking about, um, we are uh, up towards uh, South Australia, uh, with uh, but on a per capita basis above South Australia, uh, and certainly well above Tasmania, Northern Territory. Um, so we would come in 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 there uh, overall as, as 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 strong as South Australia, basically. Uh, even though South Australia has currently got more population, we're growing faster and we've got more base industries. Uh, for instance, in, in, in export volumes, we'd leave uh, all the other states for dead, mainly because of the mining. Uh, and um, the, uh, so we'd come in there very, very, very strongly. And uh, so, you know, there's a very strong base to the, uh, to the economy very very much export oriented uh, and uh, uh, so uh, yeah a strong base for that uh, that economy well that's a magnificent um, comparative uh, breakdown as, as to where we go as, as a region and compared to other states um, so you've you've actually kind of answered my, my follow-on question I, I was going to ask how would we compare with, with, with other regions but you, you've clearly answered that and also from what I've from what I've gleaned to the direct comparisons you made to really give a simple answer, uh, yes, we can, we can afford it. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, and there are some issues that we've got to address. Uh, however, the basic strength of the uh, that uh, that economy uh, is there, and uh, to uh, stand alone compared to uh, uh, compared to the other uh, states and territory. Um, the, um, uh, but of course, um, one of the major, this, okay, there's a viability question, uh, but there's also the question of the, the benefits. 
one of the problems we've got at present is sound policy making for the uh, for the region, and there's a whole host of things where um, the interests of the north and its development and so forth don't necessarily coincide uh, with the interest of the south and uh, particularly Brisbane and uh, and the uh, the southeast uh, uh, corner. And there's a whole range of them, uh, you know, that are and they crop up regularly in political discussion and. Uh, you know, simple things like cro crocodiles uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, however, things like uh, uh, we've got a growing agricultural sector. Basically in Southern Australia, it, it, it sort of slowed down. There was a lot of development of agriculture early on a century ago, um, but we're still expanding in agriculture. Uh, and uh, we've seen now Tinaroo Dam go through to be fully committed. And we need we need another dam uh, in the region to continue the uh, uh, continue the growth and, and the north because of its uh, uh, its climatic conditions and so forth and the wet and dry uh, uh, the cycle and so forth. You know, uh, water storage in tropical areas is is very important to agricultural uh, productivity, and we need dams. Uh, which have not been on the agenda very, very strongly, um, and uh, the, you know, the growth of uh, growth of agriculture in tourism. We've been seeing complaints that uh, uh, that the region's tourism is is not being promoted adequately as separate as this, uh, um, you know, it's 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 a separate product to uh, to southeast Queensland and southern Queensland. And uh, so uh, uh, in, in a new state, there's a whole lot of these issues uh, that uh, from a policy point of view, we're likely to get a, a, a much a policy uh, direction, uh, much more uh, attuned to uh, our needs. Uh, another one is uh, just the whole business of relations with the Pacific and the near north. It's terribly important to us. And we've got these links up with Papua New Guinea and. And, and so forth, but uh, uh, at times we run across that uh, really the, the, the strong links out of the south with shipping and things like that uh, aren't necessarily leading to us prosecuting uh, the uh, the opportunities uh, in those areas. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's one of the major that's one of the major things is you get a, you know, better policy making and uh, for uh, for the north. And of course, the other benefits uh, are that uh, uh, at federal level, of course, and I, the uh, Bert Brisbane has raised this and and uh, the so forth that uh, uh, compared to say Tasmania, we're grossly underrepresented. I think we've got three senators or two or three. Uh, it's been variable uh, in the uh, in the northern regions. Uh, Tasmania's got twelve. It had a guarantee mm. under the uh, the uh, federation agreement of six uh, uh, House of Representatives seats. I think we might have five, but twice the population. Uh, the uh, the Northern Territory has got two senators for a quarter of the population. Uh, so at federal level, and uh, you know, representation and of our views and our special needs. Uh, uh, is uh, we're we're badly underrepresented in the, oh, in the Commonwealth oh, Parliament. Of course, and and when you were discussing before the um, how the economy is, of course, related with with policy decisions, and uh, all of these things are, are deeply interrelated. It's a it, it's a web, and um, we're going to be able to get more contracts here in in North Queensland, more government related contracts. Uh, if we get better Senate representation, I mean, we saw what happened with the whole, you know, submarine uh, fiasco. If I, if, if I can, yes, that's right. Well, actually, one of the very disappointing things of, uh, of recent times, or yeah, going back over the past decade or so, has been on the uh, the shipbuilding here in Cairns and some decisions in Brisbane that uh, absolutely shocked me. Uh, that. Uh, we built the patrol boats back in the uh, what, 1980s, uh, late 70s, 1980s, basically with a state government guarantee of, uh, because the Navy requires a whole lot of guarantees. And uh, uh, when they hand out a, a major contract uh, like that, uh, we secured it, but uh, it was with the state government backing uh, because uh, 
uh, NQEA had difficulty meeting those uh, uh, those guarantee requirements. But uh, when it came up to the air warfare destroyers, uh, uh, Brisbane refused. Uh, and uh, we virtually had the contract and we lost it uh, because the, um, uh, the, uh, there wasn't that guarantee out of the, uh, out of the state government. And uh, of course, uh, we've been competing here uh, with our uh, with our shipbuilding uh, against uh, Western Australia and South Australia and Victoria and so forth, that have put a lot, a lot of money, uh, a lot of state money into uh, building up uh, the uh, capacity uh, in those industries. But uh, uh, the the whole marine sector here is very important to the economy. It's uh, uh, one of the areas that we have developed in manufacturing, you know, like the aviation sector. Uh, that uh, we've, we've developed a, a, a manufacturing servicing capability uh, that leads the north. And, uh, but we do need, you know, uh, a strong government uh, backing uh, on some of these, uh, some of these things. Mm. The, the absolute circular nature of, of, of the discussion we're having you know, would strike anyone listening to this. Um, so our listeners don't think it's a, just a complete love in a, and a rubber stamp. Uh, I'm sure there would be some challenges. Uh, would you be happy to outline some, some of the challenges and some of the issues that you know a new state organisation and, and the formation of a new state would have to be aware of? Yeah, well, uh, eventually, of course, uh, it will depend on uh, public opinion and, uh, and, and the public, uh, you know, wanting. Uh, and uh, I've seen some research recently where in fact, the indications are that people's hearts are in a, uh, a, a new state. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, I think uh, it's there, but of course, a lot of people are worried about viability. They're worried about uh, boundaries and things like that. And of course, um, a number of things, these things are going to have to be uh, addressed and, uh, and resolved. Uh, but basically, um, uh, what we're doing with a new state, say from Rockhampton or Gladstone North, is that traditionally we've had four strong regions. Uh, they're each uh, independent at, and at times competing. Uh, and of course, it's understandable uh, that realities of areas and distance lead to this because um, when you look across the north, uh, it's 40% of the continent. And really what you've got across the north, you've got uh, uh, six states uh, south of the tropic. Uh, the, um, but uh, north of the tropic, you've got four major regions, uh, six major regions, and uh, four in Queensland and uh, the Northern Territory and across the, north, the northwest of, uh, of Western Australia. And uh, the, uh, one of the issues, of course, in pulling together a new state in the north, of course, is to pull those four regions uh, together and solve the, uh, solve the issues of, uh, you know, how it is going to operate. Now, uh, already, of course, Australia's faced that with the, with the Commonwealth mm -hmm. and uh, where uh, the six states were, were drawn together into a uh, into a Commonwealth, into a federation, and uh, uh, one of the things, of course, we uh, we've got to address is is um, uh, pulling those those four regions in the north into a united regions of uh, of the northeast. Of course, one of the common factors uh, for us all is the uh, is the Great Barrier Reef, uh, and. Uh, I think uh, that's something we all share, uh, but we all share, of course, similarity of climate. And uh, so there are some issues there uh, that obviously, uh, you know, need to be addressed. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, with those things, of course, the public will come along. Uh, once that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, seen to be, uh, you know, viable, and of course, there's a whole lot of questions of working out in detail, you know, just what the finances would be. And uh, uh, obviously a major factor in it all is that um, the, um, uh, the Commonwealth funding uh, into, into the states uh, is really uh, dependent upon the delivery of services, uh, the Northern Territory. And 
Uh, if you take New South Wales, for instance, it's cheaper to deliver government services in Sydney, uh, a, a big dense population. Uh, but of course, in working out the factors, rural New South Wales would uh, attract more money than uh, Sydney in the formula. Uh, it, it comes out that New South Wales comes below the average. Uh, and similarly, Victoria, Queensland comes in just above the average, but Southern Queensland would come in below the average. Uh, the, the Northern Queensland area would come in a, uh, above like the Northern Territory and Tasmania and, uh, and South Australia. So we could, uh, uh, under the uh, current uh, Grants Commission uh, uh, arrangements, we would come in quite strongly there. But of course, then, however, offsetting that, we've got the very strong mining royalties that are counted into, uh, into the factor. But between all those factors, we should come in uh, with very substantial Commonwealth funding as per other states. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's an important thing to work through uh, to, uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the, what the financial situation would be. Yeah, and that's it, because when, when I'm kind of talking to people, a lot of them say, well, you know, well, Matt, it's a, it kind of gets circular. You're pro a new state, therefore you, you don't see the challenges. You're only kind of seeing, you're only seeing the positive sides of things. And one of the big points that I wanted to make in this interview is that uh, Boot Brisbane, Northern Vibe and anyone else involved in this, involved in this magnificent project are not blind to the fact that, that there are some issues around it and, and that, uh, you know, we're talking to people and, and we, we, are, we are kind of aware of it. Look, Bill, we're coming up to the hour, but with your permission, um, I'd like to keep going for a little while because we can, we can do a little bit of editing. Do you have the inclination to continue? Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm, Fantastic. I'm, Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, that being the case, um, and there's even some, because you, this has been, I have to say, this has been a really interesting conversation. And it's raised a number of questions in my mind that are incidental to the new state that I kind of want to cover off um, as well. But um, um, I know you did discuss a lot of the, a lot of the history of, of kind of what's, of what's happening in Cairns, um, but can you give us a bit of an ebb and flow of the specific uh, economic fortunes of Cairns in far North Queensland, particularly in the periods of, uh, of the, if I can use the phrase, the Biocumander, and um, since the reinstatement of the current one vote, one value system in, in 89. Can you discuss that? Uh, yeah, well, of course, um, the, the situation changed actually um, on the political front with the, uh, with the Labor Party. Uh, we have had two uh, treasurers during that period over the, over the past uh, 30 years, and that was Keith DeLacy. Uh, and standing behind Keith, of course, was that uh, brilliant uh, Treasury Secretary or Head of the uh, Treasury, Leo Hilcher, uh, who uh, was there with the Bielke peterson uh, 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 regime and uh, uh, guided the states uh, uh, very well. And of course, that influence uh, continued through into, uh, uh, into, the, uh, into the 1990s. And more recently, of course, we've had uh, Curtis Pitt, uh, who, however, he's, he was replaced as uh, Treasurer um, and uh, uh, which was a little bit disappointing for the uh, for the north, um, but on the coalition side, uh, there's been um, the of course politically the um, the the old coalition between the the National Party and the uh, uh, the Liberal Party uh, uh, continued, but it was uncomfortable, and the the National Party. There was always a, a struggle there between the Liberal Party and the National Party about being a senior a senior partner. Now, when uh, uh, Beatty brought in uh, preferential, uh, optional preferential, of course, it, it virtually forced a uh, uh, an, an amalgamation of the two. But uh, I uh, I don't think that the LNP has been. Well, you can see it in the uh, representation in the seats uh, at present. Uh, there's not um, a, a, not a great deal of representation uh, of the LNP in the uh, in the north uh, at present, and uh, a lot of that will be due to perceptions uh, of, uh, of performance, etc. Uh, however, 
yep. uh, as far as the Cairns region goes. Um, we we did really really well uh, uh, up until uh, during the 80s, then the uh, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, uh, through to about 1998 when the Asian crisis hit us. One of the things about the Cairns region is that particularly because of tourism, but also some of the other sectors, it's very much exposed to international markets, to uh, the global economy. Uh, and so uh, we tend to be hit more heavily uh, when there are those changes. And we're seeing one of those big hits at present uh, with the uh, international tourism market uh, uh, cut off. And um, so it's been a bit more uh, susceptible, but then we bounce back after uh, we, we lost a fair bit of ground there for a couple of years with the uh, Asian financial crisis, but we bounced back relatively quickly, although in that period there was SARS uh, that delayed that, there was the Gulf War uh, that uh, delayed that, and then there was 9-11 uh, that uh, delayed that. Uh, but we did bounce back, but then we went through a period, in, and this was happening in the, in the mid-90s, the Australian dollar was going up through the, uh, through the roof, and, um, and it was partly, it's not just because of commodity prices, it was because the Reserve Bank was putting up interest rates to, uh, to try and curb the economy. But one of the side uh, effects of higher interest rates in Australia is that we become very attractive to money floating around the world. And uh, when that money comes floating and chasing those higher interest rates, it puts the dollar up. And uh, so, uh, that particularly affected uh, the, the Cairns region. There was a drop in the dollar there straight after the global financial crisis. Actually, we, part, we lost the Japanese market before the global financial crisis uh, because of the, uh, and a lot of it was because of the, uh, the high dollar affecting competitiveness. And then the high dollar affected us uh, uh, after with the, uh, with the mining boom, but of course it's come back down. But then the whole the world, uh, our growth in more recent years has been uh, has been quite poor uh, compared to the last or three, four, five years. Uh, we've been right down at about one percent, whereas our long-term average uh, for Kansas the City uh, is about uh, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5. Depends on the period that you uh, you look at. Um, so uh, we have been going through a. Uh, uh, a lesser growth period. Of course, the end of the mining boom uh, saw a Townsville's growth very, very strongly cut back. Mackay actually go backwards for a while and Lockheed. And Darwin is going through a bad period after the uh, being pumped up with the, uh, the big gas project uh, uh, up there. Yeah. Look, that's... Um You've actually knocked over one of the questions that I was going to ask you. Uh, so that's kind of good. But... Um is the Cairns economy, do we have enough diversity in the Cairns economy well, right now and right before COVID? Yeah, to... actually, we do have more. Uh, I, I, I did a, an exercise recently. I was asked to have a look at the drivers of Cairns economic growth over a long period. And it took me right back into the late 1800s. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, however, uh, What's happened over the years is that um, uh, we, we had that strong growth period and mining has come through, agriculture has come through, but then the, the real uh, star performer was tourism. And uh, so we did in fact have a, a cancer development, although tourism sort of was the big uh, uh, growth factor there, some of these other sectors were, were also growing. And another thing in, in more recent decades has been that uh, coming through of, uh, of things like the marine sector and the, uh, uh, the aviation uh, servicing sector uh, that, uh, you know, giving Cairns a more diverse economy. But of course, as I outlined earlier, uh, that marine sector got badly knocked about uh, with the uh, failures over the, uh, over the shipbuilding. And uh, so, We've had a much more diverse economy than a lot of people, you know, believe. Uh, however, uh, over the last, I did an exercise from 2005, uh, uh, five, six, uh, through to the more most recent figures. And when you took out inflation, 
uh, tourism uh, had only increased by about 9% over a 16 year period or 15 year period. And uh, the, uh, however, mining or had increased by over 100% and uh, agriculture, I think it was up around 40%. Now, this is taking the value of them, but taking inflation out. This is real, you know, uh, uh, real growth. Uh, so what's been happening more recently is that the we, we had become accustomed to that tourism sector growing extremely rapidly and strongly. Now that hasn't happened over the, uh, the and uh, uh, and obviously we need to continue building up other industries. Uh, the economy of this region is not. Uh, 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 I shudder when people talk about Kansas, the tourist town. Uh, because its fundamental role is that of a regional servicing capital, a, uh, a, a distribution, a transport hub, a distribution hub, a manufacturing hub, an administrative hub, uh, a, a, a professional services and, and all that sort of thing. So it's very, very much linked in uh, with, that, uh, with that regional economy. Now, tourism is terribly important in it, uh, but the other sectors uh, are, uh, are very important in it. And to get those other sectors growing, however, we need to uh, look at very fundamental uh, uh, things like uh, there's opportunities there, and there has been in, in agriculture, but that requires it to look at dams, the Coranda Range Road, it requires it to uh, look at ports and so forth, uh, to get commodities out as opposed to, uh, to people. And uh, the other thing that is uh, come through in more recent times is that um, when I go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, or the, you go back to the 50s, Cairns was half the size of Townsville and the regional population was smaller. Uh, but now it's come through that the, the Cairns and the Cairns region uh, is now the largest in population in Northern Australia. It's always been larger than the Northern Territory, uh, but it's come through. And uh, so there are opportunities there uh, 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 a lot of the development of Kansas, the regional city, uh, has, has not occurred. For instance, in higher education, uh, we've got about half the number of people employed per head of, of population in uh, university level as the other cities of our size in Australia. Uh, and uh, obviously, there's a big push on at present to upgrade the hospital. And of course, uh, you know, the Cairns Hospital District is now uh, the biggest in terms of uh, 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 patient uh, uh, demand uh, in Queensland outside of the southeast corner. Uh, so, you know, there's opportunities there to be, uh, to be followed, uh, uh, followed through. Yeah, we must continue uh, to, to build the economy. You mentioned Winton. And one of the problems in that area is that because of those centralizing factors and they, they affect this region, we've been able to keep ahead of them because we've grown our, our earnings from the, uh, from the rest of the world. But uh, out in that country, of course, they've got very strong growth to start with, with, the, uh, uh, with the wool industry, uh, but it has tended to stagnate. And of course, all those centralizing tendencies, if you don't keep moving ahead uh, and uh, particularly earning uh, income from the uh, uh, from the rest of the world, you'll tend to go backwards. And of course, we've been facing some severe, fairly severe um, uh, centralizing effects uh, coming in. Uh, uh, and it's not just transport, it's communications. And of course, uh, some of those factors have been uh, with the um, uh, advent of computers and, and the internet and all that sort of thing, uh, how it's you know changing. Uh, the uh, the structure of employment and, and so forth the times in favour of uh, the uh, the major city certainly within the region if you if you look at those those type of factors lead to the the regional city Cairns growing faster than the uh, than the rest of the uh, the region uh, one of the important things in this region is the wide progress is that the um, uh, the, our hinterland has grown uh, partly because of, of uh, agriculture and mining and uh, 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 to a degree uh, uh, tourism. It's grown much far, our hinterland's grown faster than most other regions around Australia. Wow. 
that's um you know, that's kind of really interesting and it also indicates too that you know when you're speaking about the independence of the of the regions there cans and towns are, we're going to have to learn to get on really aren't we as much as we <laughs> yes well, that's what i said this is one of the great challenges is to form a yeah. common view uh, yeah. across those uh, those four regions uh and uh so that we do get policies uh, that are more suited to us because there's a lot of similarities in the economies we've all got elements in it of uh, 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 we've all got elements of tourism. Kansas is real big in it. We've got elements of fisheries. We've all got elements of uh, 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 mining with uh, some of the regions uh, very, very strong uh, in, that, uh, in that area. Uh, we've all got interests in uh, agriculture and pastoral industries. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, with a, uh, you know, with a, uh, a new state, uh, you know, we, we have got a common interest in those, but in the having very similar basic structures, uh, and and also uh, the ways forward for us. And uh, what we need is policies that are really attuned uh, yeah. to what uh, what we need. Exactly. And look, I, I'm sure that um, uh, you know, if push comes to shove, I'm sure that we'll uh, Townsville and I will learn to kiss and make up. We can both kind of swallow our pride yeah. and. And, and force ourselves, uh, force ourselves to, to to do that. Um, I do. I only have one more new state relevant question, um, and then if it's okay, we'll just cover off on a couple of other things. You were talking before about uh, some of the failures in regards to the maritime industry and how they were political decisions that really, really failed Kansas as a far northern region. Wait, would you mind discussing some of the best economic outcomes for regions? And some of the worst economic outcomes for the regions that have flowed on from uh, from decisions made in Brisbane, from specifically Brisbane-centric policy decisions. Uh, well, one of the most important things in the in the north, going back in time, that allowed our um, uh, horticultural sector to get up was just the sealing of the Bruce Highway uh, and the upgrading of the the Bruce Highway. Now. Uh, of course, that was terribly important at the time. Uh, the other thing uh, that was terribly important going back uh, was the uh, uh, decision to upgrade the airport, but that was mainly with Canberra. And uh, in fact, we, we got it a little bit in uh, uh, some of the people in Brisbane were pushing for Townsville, but uh, uh, the, fortunately we had at the time a minister in the, uh, in the federal cabinet in the uh, uh, form of uh, David Thompson. And uh, we got the uh, the airport upgrading through. Of course, Cairns was already an international airport with um, uh, a traffic to and from um, uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, the um, uh, so there's been, um, uh, of course, we we got a decision uh, to uh, establish the university campus. Uh, however, uh, it's always been as a sub campus. Uh, and uh, we've never sort of gone through to uh, having a, a standalone campus uh, in the area. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's been a number of decisions, there, obviously, there that, uh, you know, benefit the, uh, benefit the North. However, as I have pointed out uh, in, uh, in more recent times, there's been a, a failure in terms of per capita capital expenditure compared to other areas of the state. Not so much Brisbane, but other areas of the state. Um, and uh, uh, but on the on the on the negative side, of course, you know, there's been a number of things that uh, come through. Uh, more recently, I mentioned the uh, the shipbuilding. Uh, I mentioned um, uh, one of the things that um, was the whole Reef 2050 uh, plan. Uh, okay, it, it all sound very good about protecting the Great Barrier Reef and so forth. But basically what it's done is, as part of that plan, no new ports. Now we've got people who want to uh, uh, ship uh, silica, uh, open another silica mine at, uh, up north of Cooktown, but they've been uh, very severely affected by that, uh, uh, that policy. Of, and, and of course, there's no way in the world it's going to uh, affect the Great Barrier Reef, but, uh, but also it meant that with the dredging of uh, uh, the channel in Cairns, um, the uh, the science was point, uh, pointing to that uh, 
we could replace the uh, or place the uh, the spoil at sea without affecting the reef. Uh, however, uh, the requirement that it come on shore uh, has meant that uh, the original plan uh, would have uh, enabled us to take out four million cubic meters for about 120 million. We've just spent uh, because it had to come on shore. We've just spent 120 million. Uh, to take out less than a million cubic meters. Uh, and it means that we still can't get uh, the Voyager class ships in and, uh, and uh, you know, potential effects there on other bulk uh, uh, shipping. Um, so th there's that, there's been delay with the Korean range load. Um, of course, uh, uh, the, um, uh, there's been no uh, definite forward, the, the, the benefit cost uh, analysis of Nalinga was, was very, very, uh, very poor, technically poor, uh, that uh, it came in, in, uh, in very negative. And when you compare it with other benefit cost analyses, if you applied what was applied to Nalinga, virtually no damage stand up uh, in, uh, 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 in, uh, in viability. Uh, so, um, Oh, and then there's been all the business of uh, tree clearing and uh, with the expansion of agriculture, people uh, out in the Gulf and up the peninsula you know, wanting to expand agriculture, willing to invest in it, uh, but being, uh, being held up uh, by uh, uh, things like uh, allocations of water and tree clearing, etc. Yeah. Look, yeah, I could I could go on there. There's probably more there than I've missed. <laughs> <laughs> Look, precisely, I, I had this um I I had this fantastic conversation with John McCall and, and Jason Costigan. And something I, I I suspect part of it was me, I didn't articulate it perhaps as well as I could have. But I kept on talking about the 73 in the southeast corner. And he misunderstood it, I think, because we to give it, you know, to, to give him credit, we were having a conversation in and around how we can get the new state above the line. But to me, the other issue was that we do have this critical mass of electorates in the southeast corner, and they make Brisbane centric centric decisions. So any of the sorts of stuff that you're talking about there, it's got to fly down to Brisbane. Um, yeah, and, right. and the former speaker was like, "Well, you know, not, not really. You, you've got to get this minority from from this amount of people. You've got to speak to this amount of people." I'm like, "So what you're kind of not getting." Is that there is a culture of people who live in Southeast Corner. There are an urbane culture. You know, the somewheres and anywheres arguments, uh, you know, the the bush versus the city. These things, the, these dynamics are, are well known to people and they're real. And that's the big dynamic that we just are really never going to get over when we only have, say, 20 electorates. Yes. Uh, all of course, Queensland. The, the reality is that the North really is at a different stage of development to Southern Australia. It's, it's in a catch-up phase. Uh, and a lot of the policies that we need, uh, are probably policies that uh, were popular in, uh, in New South Wales and Victoria and, and, and the South, uh, some of it a hundred years ago, uh, you know, going back in time. And uh, uh, we do need different, uh, we, we've always needed different approaches because there's been that, that lag in development in, uh, in tropical Australia. Um, and uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, that's never been fully, you know, uh, fully recognised that there's a dynamic in there. Uh, but so you know, we're in a phase of agricultural expansion uh, that uh, was gone through, you know, uh, back in time. Uh, down and that's south. it. They, they kind of take it for granted. Because, I mean, th things are fine if you're living in the southeast corner. By magic, your food appears, you know, stuff flies in. You pick up the, you pick up the phone, you can call a police officer. They're going to be there within, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. Yes. yes. Uh, whatever, then you can name whatever it is service that you like when it comes to that. If you need a decision made, you can go to your local MP and it probably actually matters because you are part of that critical mass. There are all these dynamics that impact on these really, really, th these things that, that, that the southerners just shake their heads and go, well, you know, no, we've had enough development now. We don't need to develop any more. What we've got to do is preserve. Like they're in the preservation stage. I totally get where they're coming from from that. Well, it's more accurate as you've articulated. No, no, no. You're in the preservation stage and you need your part of the state that you've got to look at and go, well, what, what, what am I going to lock up 
as a national park? What are we going to put in an area that's a park that you can log bits of? What are we going to, you know, what are we going to give to indigenous people? What are we going to do for them? All of those decisions those guys can make, but what we kind of really want is them to get out of, get out of our backs, get out of our pockets and let us make decisions for ourselves because this weird condescension that, well, you rednecks in the North, you're just going to destroy everything. You kind of need the civilizing hand of the Southeast corner to, to stop you from chopping down everything, digging everything up, disempowering indigenous people and destroying their lives and locking them all up. And it's like, no, you've articulated it so well. They are at a different stage of uh, development. And that's, I'm going to start, I'm going to steal that phrase, Bill, be, be warned. You know, I'm, I'm stealing that and it's going to be, right. going to be in part of our, part of our stuff. Well, look, uh, we'll wrap it up on that. This has gone for an hour and 21. This is the longest interview I've done. And uh, I really, really enjoyed the chat. Thank you very much for taking time out of your very, very busy schedule to kind of talk to me today. Um, we will uh, we will be definitely putting this up on, on all of our websites. And I think we're going to be chopping it up a bit too because there's some little golden nuggets there, so some specific issues that uh, we really need to put in for the shorter videos. But look, again... Thanks very much. Interesting, informative, uh, and God willing, we'll get you back on Northern Vibe again sometime in the future. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Matt. I, uh, and uh, all my best wishes for your aspirations. Thank you.